And it says in verse 7, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now notice, Satan is always characterized in this passage as deceiving the nations. In verse 3, it said that he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years are finished. That tells me he's deceiving the nations right now. And that's why back in Revelation chapter 12, he said the devil deceiveth the whole world. He said in verse 9, you know, the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. You know, that tells me we're living in a world that's deceived. I mean, the people of this world have been lied to about so many things. I mean, they've been lied to and told that there is no God. They've been lied to and told, we have proof, we have evidence of the Big Bang. There's concrete evidence that we evolved from animals. There, we've proven, I had somebody tell me recently, science has proven that God doesn't exist. You know, people just say these things, but it just shows how deceived they are that they actually believe that. They actually believe that science has proven beyond... I mean, what's the formula for that? Science has proven the Big Bang. Science has proven... You know, it's just, it's all lies. You know, and there are so many lies about world events. You know, we see all these things in the newspaper and people just believe them, you know, and a lot of it's manipulated. And it's funny because years and years later, you learn about the deception. After these wars are fought, decades later, you look back and you find out, oh, it turns out, you know, that the Gulf of Tonkin really wasn't, you know, what we thought it was. Or you go back and look at Pearl Harbor and it turns out, oh, you know, the government had foreknowledge. Here's all the evidence. But our government today would never do anything like that. And, and you look back and you see the deception that our own government has used so many times just to get people to do what they wanted them to do. They lied to them and deceived them just to try to get them in line with a certain program that they wanted to carry out. And they're doing the same thing today. They're lying to us every day. The Bible says that the, the devil is the God of this world. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What's that talking about? High places of authority. I mean, high places in our government are occupied by people who engage in spiritual wickedness. And, and they literally worship Satan. And it's amazing how people lift up these politicians and, oh, he's a Christian, he's a godly politician, he's Republican, you know, he's, he's a born again a Christian. And these are the same people that are passing legislation to murder babies through abortion. They want to bomb innocent people over in this country, you know, because the, for the love of money. You know, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence from your lust, which war you remember? You know, you kill and desire to have... And there are greedy, evil people running the governments of our world. The love of money is the root of all evil. They lie to you. They deceive you. They say they're a Christian. They say God bless you. And in reality, they literally worship Satan. They, they, I mean, look, look at our government that promotes sodomy and homosexuality. Look at our government that promotes abortion, that promotes so much wickedness and sin and is constantly lying to us. And yet we're deceived by it. The Bible says there will come a day where the devil is locked up and he won't be able to deceive the nations anymore for a thousand years. The truth will prevail. We'll actually know the truth about the world that we live in. Unlike now where we're being bombarded by lies. That's why this book is the only thing you can trust. Don't trust what any news outlet tells you. Trust the Bible. The Bible will give you the truth. And so we see here that the devil is a deceiver. And when he comes out of the bottomless pit, after he's been locked in hell for a thousand years, he's going to go out to deceive the nations. You know, that's what he's been good at all these years, uh, which are in the four quarters of the earth. Watch this, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now go back quickly to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, I think that this blows my mind more than anything else when I look at some of the teaching that's out there on Bible prophecy. Because it seems like everybody that preaches on Gog and Magog, everybody who teaches on Bible prophecy, it seems like, they always want to talk about Gog and Magog as if it's something that's about to happen. And I mean, there are all these prophecy conferences and people come from all over and they come to this Middle East Bible prophecy conference and it's all about Gog and Magog and this battle of Gog and Magog is right around the corner. But here's the funny thing about it, folks. Gog and Magog are only mentioned twice in the whole Bible, okay? You know, aside from being in a genealogy, just 
who they humanly were in Chronicles. You know, Gog and Magog are only mentioned twice. One of those times is in Ezekiel 38 and 39. The other time is in Revelation 20. Now let me ask you this. When is the battle of Gog and Magog taking place according to Revelation 20? Is it before the millennium or after the millennium? It's after the millennium. Does that sound like something that we can kind of look at the Middle East and see it starting to gear up for happening? It's over a thousand years away. Why would anything that's happening in the Middle East right now have anything to do with the battle of Gog and Magog? But it makes for a really interesting prophecy conference. I mean, it makes for a really interesting sermon to preach. But folks, how can people teach that the battle of Gog and Magog will take place before the millennium or even before the tribulation or during the tribulation when the Bible clearly says that the battle of Gog and Magog will take place? I mean, why did he even bring up Gog and Magog? He said the devil's going to deceive all the nations. Why name those two? Why specifically say he'll go out to deceive the nations, comma, Gog and Magog, because he's trying to point us back to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and to tell us that the events in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are being fulfilled in Revelation 20. And yet, I'm sure that probably all over the world this month, there are probably going to be preachers and conferences and prophecy teachers that are going to tell you that the battle of Gog and Magog... And, and look, there's a, a famous movie left behind... It's basically just a fairy tale is what it is. It has nothing to do with biblical truth. And I would highly suggest you to ignore anything that you think you learn. I mean, look, if you want to know how things are not going to happen with Bible prophecy, just watch Left Behind. And it's just everything's the opposite. You know, if you want to know what the Antichrist is going to be like, just look at the Antichrist in the Left Behind movie. That's probably the opposite of what he's going to be like. You know, in the Left Behind movie, the Antichrist is this, you know, clean cut, short haired guy in a business suit with a East European accent? What in the world? And people are going to believe that guy's Jesus? You got to be kidding me. Obviously, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be believable and he's going to look like what people would expect Jesus to look like. He's going to have long hair and he's going to have olive skin and he's going to have a beard and he's going to be dressed and looking like all the fake pictures of Jesus. Of course, Jesus had short hair, I believe, because the Bible says that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And men are commanded to have short hair. Ladies are commanded to have long hair to be in their proper gender roles. But this movie is so wrong. And in this movie, one of the first things that happens in this movie is the battle of Gog and Magog. I mean, that's, that's one of the first things in the movie. Before the rapture even happens, they've got the battle of Gog and Magog. That should tell you right away that this movie is nonsense. Anybody who teaches you that the Battle of Gog and Magog is taking place before the millennium is sorely mistaken because Revelation 20 makes it clear. But if we look back at Ezekiel 38, it says in verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against them. And uh, just to point out some, some highlights, verse 11 says this, And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now let me ask you this, O thou who believes, that the battle of Gog and Magog's right around the corner. Is the nation of Israel today dwelling safely with no walls, no bars, no gates, unwalled villages? I mean, is the nation of Israel today just going to bed every night with their front door unlocked? Have they just put away all the weapons and they're just dwelling safely? The nation of Israel has more security. They have more metal detectors and machine guns and tanks and barbed wire and walls. I mean, they are not feeling safe right now. This scripture does not apply, my friend. Now, I will tell you what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about. Because you'll say, well, some things in Ezekiel 38 and 39 do not fit an interpretation of taking place after the millennium. But let me say this. Some of the events in Ezekiel 38 and 39 are prophesying about short-term events that happened back then. Because a lot of times when you're reading Old Testament Bible prophecy, especially Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, 
there's an immediate interpretation of things that are happening right now or in the very near future, then there's an end times Bible prophecy application. Well, let me tell you something. The end times Bible prophecy application is for sure after the millennium, Revelation 20. Any other application is just talking about something that was happening back in the Old Testament. But see this verse 11 that I just read for you that talks about dwelling safely, unwalled villages, no gates, no bars. Doesn't that make perfect sense if it's after the millennium? Because during the millennium, they're going to beat all their weapons into plowshares, right? They're going to beat all their swords into, into pruning hooks. They're going to dwell peacefully. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb. Sure, they're going to leave the front door unlocked. Sure, they're going to dwell and safely without walls, right? I mean, doesn't that make sense for the millennium? That's because that's what it really is about. Here's another highlight. It says in verse 22, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So in chapter 38, 22, he talks about raining down fire and brimstone from heaven when he's judging Gog and Magog. But in Revelation 20, it says... In verse 8, that he gathers Gog and Magog. Look at verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So isn't that compatible with what we see in Ezekiel 38, fire coming down from heaven and devouring them? Look at chapter 39 of Ezekiel, verse 6. And I will send a fire on Magog. Isn't that compatible with Revelation 20? And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And I don't want to spend the whole night on that, but really it should just be enough to see Gog and Magog in Revelation 20 and Ezekiel 38 and 39 only to show you the timing of when those prophecies are going to be put in their proper place, left behind notwithstanding. Basically what's going to happen is after the millennium, the devil's going to go out and deceive all the nations to rebel against Jesus Christ. Because remember, Jesus Christ has been ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Now, there are three types of people that are going to exist during the millennium. First of all, there are the saints who were resurrected in the first resurrection that went up at the rapture that are going to return with Christ at the Battle of Armageddon. They're going to be in heaven for a few years. Then they're going to return with Christ on white horses at the Battle of Armageddon and rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. Now, are those people able to be killed or to die? No, they've already been raised. They're in a, and look, we're going to be in glorified bodies. We're not, we're not going to be in a flesh and blood body. We're going to be in a flesh and bone body, but we're going to be in a spiritual body. We're going to be sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And so we, because it's going to be us, we're part of this first group, we will be immortal. We will not die. We will live in the millennium. We will have a glorified body. But then there are going to be two types of other people in the millennium. Number one, they're going to be mortal, mortal men who are saved, but they got saved after the rapture, you know, or, or maybe they were even born after the rapture, grow up, get saved, right? So there's going to be the immortal saints of God that came back to rule and reign with Christ. Then there are going to be saved mortal men, and then there are going to be unsaved mortal men. You say, unsaved mortal man? Wouldn't everybody be saved if Jesus is reigning on the earth? No, because Jesus is going to be a man on the earth, ruling and reigning, just like we will be men on the earth reigning under him. But not everybody's going to believe that he is really who he says he is. Just like when he came the first time. Did everybody believe in him? Did everybody? I mean, and you say, yeah, but what about when they see supernatural things? Okay, did they see supernatural things the first time he came? Did they see him multiply food? Did they see him raise the dead? And yet even when he raised Lazarus, a lot of people just refused to believe on him. You say, how can they not believe when they see him? Because this is the thing. They're going to see Jesus, and they're going to see him ruling and reigning. They're going to know he has powers. They're going to know that he has ability to perform miracles that they can't perform. They're going to notice that those that are his servants cannot be killed, cannot die, are immortal, and have power that they do not have. But there will be people that are unsaved. There will be people who do not believe. And you say, well, what explanation could they have? Well, there's going to be some deception that the devil's going to fool a lot of unsaved people into believing, but they might tell themselves that, you know, well, I just believe that these people have found, I'm just making stuff up right now, but this is the type of deception that could be used. This is just speculate. Everything I've preached so far has been fact. Now I'm going to get into a little speculation, okay? Uh, this is just my opinion. But I think there could be a deception that says, well, you know, the reason that these people can't die and the reason why their leader, Jesus, has all this power 
is because of the fact that they've found access to a certain technology that they're withholding from us. They've got access to these life-extending technologies. They've got access to these powers and technologies that they want to keep us enslaved. I mean, think, think about, picture this now. And I know we're going way into the future. We're going to a, a, a time period that is very different than the day that we live in. But think about the scenario where you've got a, very much a two-class system here where one class of people is immortal and has all this power under Jesus Christ. And then there's another class that's just your typical average mortal man that, that, that gets sick and dies and so forth. You know, they could say, hey, wait a minute, they're ruling over us with a rod of iron. They're making all these rules. We don't want to follow these rules. They're the bosses, and we have to obey them. And here we are getting sick, dying. They never get sick. They never die. They're withholding technology from us that keeps them as the bosses and keeps us under them. Can't you see that lie being permeated by people who just don't want to believe in the truth of what's happening. And they'll say, this guy's not really Jesus. He's just claiming to be Jesus. He really just has, has access to technology. You know, this is just the global elite, you know, that have gotten these life-extending technologies and they don't want anybody to stop. You know, you can see how things could be twisted and turned around to say that. Now, the other thing is that the Bible talks about that it's when the thousand years are expired that Satan goes out and, be, and deceives the nations. I don't think he's going to deceive them overnight. I think that deception is going to take time. And if you think about it, maybe if they're thinking of this as a thousand-year reign of Christ and then the thousand years are expired and it's been a thousand and one years, thousand, two years, thousand, three, they're saying, wait a minute, this is never going to end. This has nothing to do with the millennial reign of Christ. These people are lying. You know, they have access to some technology. So that's just kind of a little food for thought. Again, that was speculation. Okay, back into, back into the truth of what the Bible actually says here. So he goes out and deceives the nations, and they think, you know what? We're going to attack. We're going to overthrow Jesus and his servants. And so basically, the servants of God and Jesus Christ are all basically at Jerusalem here because of this attack that's coming, and they surround the city, and they're going to just finally try to overthrow Jesus, you know, because the devil has provoked them to do so. And then what's going to happen? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them.